Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're in a sermon series called What It Means to Follow Jesus. When Jesus was 30 years old, he began his public ministry, and the first thing he did was to gather a group of guys whom he could train. They're called his disciples. Many times in Scripture, he invited people to become his disciples. Today, he makes the exact same offer to you. Come, be my disciple. In John 15, 8, he said to us all, be my disciples. Question then, what's a disciple? It means student, means learner. Not not so much a scholar, not like that so much, but uh, a disciple is like an apprentice. Now, in John 15, Jesus doesn't say, His words are not, I am the trainer and you are the trainee. Nor does he say, I am the mentor, you are the disciple. Although that is what he's talking about. But he's got something more radical in mind than the normal teacher-student paradigm. So to bring this out, what he says is, I am the vine and you are the branches. It's all about discipleship Jesus style. And it's what we're going to try and unpack here this morning. On the fair island where we live, Long Island, New York, there are plenty of vineyards, and some of you know a thing or two about them. Uh, but lots of us know hardly anything about grapes, except for maybe you know what we read on the label of a, of a bottle of wine. Right? What, what are the, who writes this stuff? This pairs nicely with seafood and fresh fruit, okay? It always sounds so classy. It, it never says, pairs nicely with cheese doodles and baked beans on toast. Where, where's that wine? <laughs> anyway, uh, for our, our purposes, uh, we don't have to be experts, so there's just a couple of things you've got to know when it comes to grape growing. And the first is, what is a vine? And the second is, what is a branch? Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Okay, well, in a vineyard, what is the vine and what is the branch? Okay, you know how when you drive past a vineyard, you're probably out east. Well, we got vineyards right here in St. James, but I don't know. My memory is driving out east somewhere. Um, and, uh, and you go by these, these vineyards, and, and there's these wires, right, stretched between posts with grapes growing on them. Well, the long, skinny bits growing along those wires, those are not the vines. That is a common mistake. Those are the branches. Grape branches grow along those wires. Okay, well, then where's the vine? The vine is the woody thing, thick as your arm, even thicker, which has got roots going down and grows up out of the ground, okay? From the thick vine, the branches shoot out along the wires. And, of course... Grapes and leaves grow out on the ends of the branches. Also, thing to know, the fellow whose job it is to take care of all those grapes, all those vines and stuff, he's called the vine dresser. In verse 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine. So Jesus is the, the woody bit with the roots, okay? He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. What is a vine dresser looking for? Plain and simple, fruit. He's not looking for leaves. I mean, leaves grow like crazy, but that's not what he wants. He's not looking for wood. He's looking for fruit. And not just a few tiny, sour little grapes. He's looking for big, juicy, delicious grapes and lots of them. As it says in the reading, much fruit. This is important. In our reading, five times in eight verses, Jesus uses the words, bear fruit. It's what he's looking for from his disciples. He said in verse eight, by this is my father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. All right, that's that important. What's, what's fruit? Well, of course, in, a, in an actual grapevine, obviously it's a grape. But what is it in a disciple's life? It's good works. Good works. I might help an elderly person carry their groceries out to their car. That's a good work. If I was a branch, that would be a grape. Or I might explain to a friend over lunch how Jesus came from heaven in order to take sinners back there with him. Okay? 
that he, that, he, that he went to hell to cancel our reservation there, and that he opened the gates of heaven to any and all who would believe. Telling someone that is a good work. Again, if I was a branch, that would be a grape. Fruit. Fruit is good works. And it's not just in John 15, it's all over the Bible. Titus 3 verse 14, for example, says, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works and not be unfruitful. So following Jesus means we're his disciples. And what he's trying to teach us, his disciples, is how to bear a lot of fruit. Fruit Fruit is what grows out of a Christian's life. Fruit, fruit is the good that grows out of our faith in Christ. Some of it comes in the form of improved character. And we might call that kind of fruit, inner fruit. Now, for example, Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are, those are character traits. Inward fruit, if you like. But there's also outward fruit. And I've already given a couple of examples of that. Good works. So whether you're fixing a fence for a widow, taking care of an ill neighbor, or spending a lifetime as a missionary in the jungle, outward fruit appears not when you're living life for yourself, but when your motive is to bring glory to God. Farther in John 15, like past where we had our reading today, down in verse 16, Jesus says, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. See, fruit is your only permanent deposit in heaven. You can spend your whole life trying to build up a pile of money. You won't take one penny with you. Not a cent. But your good works they go on ahead of you to heaven. Real fruit always lasts. And it's the main reason that God has still got you here on this earth to produce it. Paul even told Christians in Ephesians 2 that they were created in Christ for good works. So you might suppose that something this crucial to God's plan would happen automatically in your life and mine, that it would just happen automatically. Nothing could be farther from the truth uh, and Jesus brings this out in, in, in his illustration. Uh, did you know that the branches on an actual grapevine, if you just leave them to the se themselves, they hardly produce any grapes at all? Hardly any. Oh, they produce lots and lots of leaves, tons of leaves, and, and yards and yards of long stringy wood, but hardly any decent grapes. No, for, for a vineyard to really produce fruit, the branches have to respond to the attentions of a vine dresser. The vine dresser is crucial to the whole thing, to actually getting grapes you'd want to eat and make wine out of. Now, what does the vine dresser do? Well, Jesus tells us. Uh, first, he talks about what's done with uh, unproductive branches. Without a vine dresser working the vineyard, there are plenty of these, okay? Okay. Uh, as, as people who actually work in vineyards will tell you, new branches have a tendency to trail down and grow along the ground. That's what they do all by themselves. The, the thing is, they don't bear fruit down there. When the branches grow along the ground, the leaves get all coated in dust and yuck, and when it rains, they get moldy and mildewed. The branches become sick and useless. Point being, a believer can be this way. They may be a branch connected to the vine. So I'm saying they are someone who does believe in Jesus. But they're down low for some reason. And unless something changes, they're not going to bear good fruit for the Lord. You say, well, what could that be, Pastor? What's going on with people like that? What's happening? Well, I'll tell you now what I often see as a pastor. That so many do believe in Jesus. They do, but still there's vital truth that just hasn't got into them. Well, like what? Well, I got some examples. I see this all the time. Like they don't know for certain that they're going to heaven when they die. Now, that is a discouraging. That is demotivating. 
at a deep level to not know for certain that you're going to have a happy ending, i.e. in heaven. But very often, I mean very often, people who believe, I believe in Jesus, but they don't know this. How, why don't they? Well, the most common reason is that they're not sure that they are good enough to go to heaven. And they think, well, I might be good enough to heaven, but I might not. I'm not sure. Okay, they don't know. But here's the thing. Please listen. No one is good enough to go to heaven. Not, not me, not you. Not even one person is good enough to go to heaven. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the reason, and there is a reason, we can, be, can and should be certain of going to heaven, it's got nothing to do with our goodness. Nothing to do with it. Rather, it's because God, for Jesus' sake, is totally forgiving of your badness. Your badness would have kept you out. God totally forgives it. That's why you can be sure of going to heaven. You did not deal with badness by being good. People think that, oh, I've done more goods than bad. This is nonsense. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't change things. Okay? God dealt with your badness for you by dying for it for you. And now because he really did that in great love, he wants you now, he wants you to have confidence. Confidence that you're going to heaven for sure. No ifs, ands, or buts. Because when you know that, there's a hope inside you that lifts you, and without it, you're flat. Another reason why people who, don't, who, who do believe in Jesus are nonetheless down like a branch on the ground is that they've got their identity and the, what they think is the basis for their identity. They got it all wrong. So uh, please, on this score, don't get preoccupied with your harsh father or mother or with your victimhood or something like that or with your struggles with sexuality. Now, I'm not saying you have not had hard knocks, and I'm not saying you don't have struggles. I am saying that none of these things give you your true identity. Your identity is far more positive. It's far more secure. Because you are who God says you are. And in Christ, God says you are a saint. You're his child. You're baptized to be his child, forgiven and beloved by him, having his favor always. This truth sinks in and will lift a struggling Christian up. One more reason, well, there's a bunch, but one more I'm going to give you that I find that Christians are down is because of uh, maybe a a big, big loss. There's all kinds of huge losses people can have. Or a recent failure on their part. Either a moral failure or in their career, something like that. They, they then conclude inwardly that they've been discarded. God has discarded them. They feel broken, lost. Such a branch feels uh, down. Too down to bear fruit. What does the vine dresser do then with branches such as these? Does he cut them off and throw them away? Absolutely not. Like, God forbid. <laughs> to, to a vine dresser, that is a very shocking suggestion. The, the, the branch is much too valuable for that. In an actual vineyard, a vine dresser will, will, will go through with a bucket of water, looking, searching for those branches on the ground. And, and then... He gets them and he, and he, he, he lifts them up and he, he washes them off, he gives them this care. Next, he'll, he'll wrap them around the trellis or he'll tie them up somehow. And pretty soon, given a little time, they start thriving. It's exactly what Jesus describes in verse 2 of our reading. He said, Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he lifts up, he lifts them up. Now, the problem is, you would not see that in the reading as we have it printed in our bulletin. Why? Because there's a serious mistranslation. The Greek word in question, you know, the New Testament's originally written in Greek. Uh, the Greek word in question is airo. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he airo or aire. Now, what does that mean? 
Well, let me read it to you from the theological dictionary of the New Testament. Look how fat that book is, okay? All right? I row, the very first meaning given, to lift from the ground. It, it is done. It couldn't be clearer. It could not be clearer. Then, then, okay, then why in our reading does it translate it take away? Because the translators never asked any vineyard workers how they do their job, and they just assumed that one of the secondary meanings of Iro, like take away, must be correct. That is certainly not correct. The unfruitful branch on the ground, and understand I'm talking about a person now, is loved and lifted up by our Father. To, to those whose spirits are broken, he brings assurance. He brings healing to them. To the discouraged, brings encouragement and truth to those who are missing it somehow. God tenderly lifts the low branches up. It's, it's like in the hymn, love lifted me. Then, up off the ground, the branch is put on the trellis of discipleship and now it's possible for it to bear wonderful fruit for the Lord, which it will, given a little time. But the vine dresser's not done. Jesus went on to say, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. He's after the fruit. More fruit. Because remember this, a left to itself, a branch, it's going to grow in lots of ways. Lots of ways. It'll put energy into its leaves, tons of leaves, and into the wood, etc., etc., and have little energy left over for grapes. So the vine dresser prunes back the excess leaves, the excess wood, those excess little shoots, so that as much energy as possible can go into good fruit. Similarly, Energy of a Christian's life can go in all kinds of directions. Some of them, some of them just wrong. Uh, some of them that are, you know, the father considers a waste of time. You could spend your whole life watching TV. You know, come on. Is that a gigantic sin? No, but it's not going to bear any fruit. And the father will prune a disciple. How? Using his word. His word. Say, for example that you put all your effort, all your attention into getting rich. This is a very common story. And say it's you. You know, work, now working and making a living, that's a good thing. But in your case, say, <coughs> you've just made money the most important thing. You've made it your God. It's, it occupies all your thinking and attention. Let's say that's you. Well, what's going to happen? The Lord's going to prune you. <laughs> he, he, he's he's going to call to you to turn from your preoccupation with work and money. Repent. And put Jesus first. Not that you'll never work again. You're going to work. But you're going to put Jesus first. In fact, any, not just that one, but any idolatry you have, which is like anything you look to as more important to your happiness than God, he's going to prune you on. Like what? Like a popularity. People, that's what it's all about. Getting likes and stuff. Or um, entertainment. Or sex. Success, family can be an idol, power, personal appearance. There's a long list of possible idolatries. And, and you know what? One or more of them affects every one of us. We're all susceptible to this. Me too. So God is going to prune, meaning he's going he's to call you to repentance. And if you ignore his call or you don't take it seriously, you know, blah, blah, blah in church. I have no, I'm not changing anything about my life. God's not going to give up. He'll let circumstances that stem from your idolatry, he, he, he's not going to protect you from the pain of them anymore. He'll going to let those circumstances start to hurt for you so that you do turn from your idol to him. And Christ wants you to understand all this because what is it that people think when they get in these situations? Pain shows up, things start falling apart in some way, and people conclude, oh, God does not like me. No, just the opposite. He loves you. His attention is all over you, his precious branch. But he wants you to have an abundant, fruitful life. And that means you've got to be living for him. Pruning, therefore, is about repenting. 
repenting of sin, idolatry, and unbelief, all that wild, leafy, woody growth, it's got to go. But this is not impossible. We're not talking about an impossible task. You can repent right now. And there's total forgiveness in Jesus. You can turn from whatever the sin is to the true vine this morning. And then what? Then keep repenting. Being a fruitful disciple, it's not about getting it perfect every day. That's not going to be anybody's experience. You're not going to get it perfect every day. But it is about repenting every day. Every day, turn from the idolatry, sin, and unbelief that just seem to spring up from who knows where and start growing in our lives. It happens to me like every day. All kinds of weird attitudes and things. They're growing up in me. What do I do? Every day, go to the Father, get all that pruned off. And turn in its place to Jesus. Jesus first. Be restored and renewed in him. Jesus said every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And he went on, already you are clean because of the word, the word I've spoken to you. Then Jesus gets to the most important lesson of all. The most important secret for bearing fruit. Five times in the next five verses, he repeats the words, abide in me. To abide means to remain, to stay closely connected, to settle in for the long term. With this picture, Jesus is showing the disciples how an ongoing, vital connection with him will directly determine the amount of his supernatural power at work in their lives. Abide in me. He keeps saying it. You can sense the passion and poignancy of his plea. We must be together. Abide in me. It's it's actually a command. Uh, Abide is an imperative, not a suggestion or request. Now, you don't have to command a child to eat dessert. You command someone to do something when it's something that does not come naturally. Abiding in Jesus doesn't come naturally. You got to make it, got to be intentional about it. It, it, it's, it's the vine dresser who takes the initiative with the, uh, with the low branches and with what they need and with the ones that need pruning. Our role in those cases is to respond to what he's doing. But when it comes to abiding, there's a 180 degree shift in who it is that's initiating because to abide, we must act. In abiding, it's our move. And notice just how important it is. We're helpless to bear real fruit alone. The Lord said, the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Obviously, right? I mean, imagine a grape branch severed from the trunk, severed from the, the vine and lying in the dust. I don't mean one that's on the ground, still, still in the vine, but it's, it's growing on the ground. I mean, it's been cut and lying on the ground. For that severed branch to produce one new leaf, flower or grape would be impossible. We've got to abide in the vine. So then understand, when lovely spiritual fruit, either of an inward nature, the fruit of the Spirit, or an outward sort of good works, when it's not showing up in your life in abundance, the solution is not, as the world would coach you, to try on your own to make fruit happen, to stand on your head until it happens. You know, if it's going to be, it's up to me. That's exactly wrong. How many times did Jesus repeat, abide in me? This is the secret. He is the true vine. And the key to abundant fruit is to remain, abide, live in him and he in you. Once again, he said, I'm the vine You're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. The question then for disciples is how? How do we abide in Jesus? What does that look like in practice? A few key things go into this. First, having a prayer life. Now I'm aware that lots of people Go lots of days together without prayer. This is not a prayer life. Every day, make a prayer request to God. Talk to your Father in heaven and present your request to him. Also, talk over with Jesus 
what's really going on with you. It may not be in the form of a request. You're just, you're emotionally, you've got stuff going on. Talk about it with him. Abide in him emotionally. He really is your counselor. And listen in your spirit for assurance and promptings and truth. The Holy Spirit will give you from him. Things are going to, you're going to start connecting. Second, get God's word, the words of the Bible into you. So much so that it affects your thinking. You you know how if you have a a glass of wine or two or even more, you know, this affects you. It affects your thinking. Yes, your own thoughts, they're still there. You got your own thoughts, but they're deeply affected by the wine. Well, this is a flawed illustration, I know, but what I'm saying is get the word of God into you like that. You'll still have your own thoughts, but now they'll seriously be under the influence of Jesus. That only happens if you get his word into you. So you're going to have to read your Bible. In in church, we try to saturate the whole vineyard here with the word, right? In fact, this is a suggestion. Um, Some people are intimidated by reading the Bible. I, I get that. You could use your bulletin. And a couple of times this week, um, read, read through it. Pray through it. The, the, you know, when you get to the readings, at least the, you'll have heard a sermon on it. It won't be so mysterious. You heard a, you heard a uh, teaching on it, okay? And just let, let it soak in. Sometimes less is more, but, but not nothing, okay? Um, the songs, too, the prayers, it, see if that works. But one way or another, well, Jesus said in John 8, 31, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples. Third, Finally, make a conscious decision and commitment to be Jesus' disciple, to be his branch, seeking to bear fruit. His apprentice, who actually joins with him in the kingdom work that he's risen from the dead and he's doing all around us. I want to join with him in this. Make a decision to go for it. Now, you're not going to be perfect. That is not going to happen. You're sometimes going to blow it, sometimes big time. But Jesus knows that, and he's still calling you. He's calling you, and in spite of your flaws, you can learn and continue to try to put into practice what he's teaching. Have an abundant life. Sign up to be his disciple. Amen. Now, may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus for life everlasting. Amen.